welcome to Pain Points. Uh, I'm Dr. Jake Kaler, based out of Austin, Texas. I'm a double board certified interventional pain physician. And today we're going to be talking about neck pain. Uh, neck pain is one of those really challenging things because we see a number of different tissues from the cervical spine all the way through the muscles, ligaments, tendons that support it. So today we're going to be talking about neck pain, what causes it, and what are the treatment options we have for it going forward. Um, as always, the goal of these sessions is education um, because we believe you to be powerful and capable of understanding this information. This is also an interactive session, uh, so bring up anything that you want to talk about um, and I'll be able to address that both here live as well as after the fact on Facebook or YouTube if that's where you're watching this. Um, thank you again for joining me. If you have uh, friends or family members or you yourself are suffering from this, remember this is about advocacy both for ourselves as well as others. So thanks again. Let's move forward. Today we're talking about neck pain and specifically we're going to start with cervical spine anatomy. And the goal of that is really to figure out, okay, if we have pain in the neck, what could it be from? There's a number of things. How do we evaluate that as the physician? And then how can we possibly treat that? So we're going to talk about the basis of that, which is cervical spine anatomy. And then we're also going to be talking about pain generators of the neck. Because just because we find something on imaging does not mean that that is potentially the thing that's causing the pain. We have to take the imaging, the physical exam examination, the history, all of that together to be able to identify where we're gonna go. We're gonna be talking about pain patterns. What are some classic features of how uh, the neck moves and where that pain can start and go to be able to help, help us identify different pain generators. And I think the thing that's really interesting when we look at even just the neck in general is, Look at all the different ways the neck moves. It has to move in flexion, it has to move in extension, it has to move in lateral bending, left to right, and as well as rotation. This is a very unique aspect of our body, and to be able to do this is actually a, a very beautiful thing. Um, but when it starts to go wrong, when we, starts to have, when we start to have that degenerative cascade, that's when pain can be really, really challenging. And we're going to be talking about our special focus going forward. We have something cool in store for you for the next four sessions. We're going to take a little deviation away from the lecture format and start to learn a little bit about a therapy that's very near and dear to my heart. So anatomy of the neck. When we think about the neck, there are seven cervical vertebrae that actually connect our skull to the thoracic spine. The job of these thoracic or of these cervical vertebrae and the discs in between are to give us that full range of motion while also being able to support this thing that's essentially a ball on a stick. And if you, if you think about the challenges that go into designing something that is stable, our head, for example, on top of our neck, which has to move in every different direction, while containing within it not only all of the sensory and motor innervation that goes to our entire body through the spinal cord, but also the blood supply from our heart, the tissues to hold it up, the, the muscles that give us that stability. It really is an amazing thing, but that does mean that there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And with years of wear and tear, those things become really challenging to peel apart. The cervical spine, like I said before, has unprecedented motion. It has to move in every dimension. But that also means that when we lose that motion, it becomes very, very apparent. And that can be quite disabling and distressing for patients. In addition to the nerve roots, the vertebral artery goes through the actual bones of the uh, cervical vertebra to supply the circle of Willis. And that's the entire uh, nerve or uh, arterial system that gives blood to our brain and allows us to have oxygen so we can think. Many of the structures of the lumbar spine also exist within the cervical spine. And so when we talked before, we're going to be building upon foundations that we started talking about when we talked about low back pain and lumbar spinal anatomy. Many of those same structures are here. The, the discs, the facet joints, the nerve roots, many of those are what we call in medicine conserved in that they exist in multiple parts of our body. Um, and so that's something that we're going to see here. Absolutely. When we look at uh, the way the, the spinal cord and the nerve roots are situated within the cervical spine, we continue to have the same features. The, the vertebral bodies are in front of our spinal cord, the spinous processes are in back, and we have nerve roots that exit at every level. Those nerve roots can be pinched by the discs from the front, 
or they can be pinched from arthritis coming from those facet joints, very similar to the lumbar spine. Additionally, in the cervical spine, we have this thing that's called the uncovertebral joint, which is just another thing that can possibly pinch the nerve that goes out of the spinal cord. And that's why we can have things like headaches, neck pain, arm pain, all contributing to the overall pain pattern. On top of all that, we actually have these really, really important structures of the spine. And these are really the tendons, the ligaments, the nerves, the muscles. All of these are critical in terms of being able to move our head around. So while we might think, okay, pinched nerves are the important aspect, there's so many layers of muscles and tendons on top of that that can be playing a role. So in addition to the classic pain patterns we're going to be talking about, we also have to talk about each one of these muscles. Where does it start? Where does it go? Can it be strained? Because your body is innately able to spasm down these muscles to try to protect things like a nerve root that's being pinched. Yes, that's the first thing that happens. If you break your arm, for example, your body's going to swell and spasm muscles around that. And the goal is to stabilize that arm so that it can heal. The problem is that becomes a maladapted response in the cervical spine when we still have to be able to move and take care of ourselves because fusing that isn't always the ask or isn't always the answer to that for our spine innately. It might need to be surgically corrected. When we talk about pain generators of the neck, there's a number that are actually important. Here we have the cervical spine on the right, and it's the bones of it are actually look vastly different than those of the lumbar spine. And that's something that's really, really important to notice. The first key thing that we'll notice here is that the facet joints, which are actually over here on the right side, these facet joints actually are oriented more horizontally compared to our lumbar spine. And that's because these joints actually bear a little bit more weight. Now, if pain is still worse with extension and putting more pressure on those joints, that can definitely be an indicator that this is where the pain is coming from. But we also have to think about the nerves, the uncovertebral joint, which is that other joint. And it's not, it doesn't really show up well here on this picture, but there's a number of other things that can cause pain in addition to the discs, the vertebral bodies, nerve pinching. So when we talk about global pain generators of the neck, everything that can possibly cause it, we have degenerative disc disease. We've talked about that extensively. We have arthritis from those facet joints. Those are kind of our two big ones. We have pinched nerves. Uh, we have uncovertebral joint hypertrophy. We have, we have pinched nerves causing cervical radiculopathy. We have cervical spinal stenosis, and so that can be pinching of the spinal canal itself. And then on top of that, we have overlying muscle spasm or tissue pain, both of which can cause a significant amount of uh, distress to the patient. And all of this together, we have to take to try to put together the pain pattern to identify which one of these things is causing the pain. And that's why it's not so easy as to say, okay, here's a painometer. We can, we can definitely tell where your pain's coming from. No, we have to peel these layers away to be able to get to one as the primary pain generator. When we look at the, uh, the cervical spine from cross section, this is really what I want to highlight here is the vertebral bodies look different, but they still maintain the, their same basic architecture. We have this soft, squishy disc in the middle. We have a nice outer rim of fibrous disc, and these can actually push off and pinch onto the nerves here as they're coming out. This can cause pain that goes the arm. It can cause pain that goes down into the, into the spine. Of the di putting the diagnostic puzzle together to figure out where the pain is coming from. When we talk about pain patterns, we're going to look at some classic ones here today. And this is what we're trying to do when we get the history and physical examination. With regard to um, pain patterns, there's kind of two general classes of pain patterns that we've really highlighted. And in addition to muscle pain and tendon pain, those muscles that start in one area and go to another area, we also have these referred pain patterns, which we're going to talk about. And the first of which is cervical radiculopathy and spinal canal stenosis. When we think about this, there's a nerve root that can be pinched. And that nerve root comes out, exits the foramen, comes out of the spinal cord, and is going to go to some area. That area, if you have a pinched nerve, you might feel pain in that area. 
And when we're doing dermatome mapping, if you've ever seen one of these pictures on our office or in our office or online, what we're trying to figure out is, okay, where you have pain or where you feel pain is indicative of an area that might be pinched on an MRI. And so that's what we're trying to figure out. Do you have a C6 nerve pattern? Do you have a C8 or a T1 nerve, nerve pattern or a radiculopathy? All these things are really important from a nerve pinching standpoint. Now here we're going to see the really challenging aspect of our job. Now we're going to look at what if it's a cervical facet joint or a disc? Where do, where do those pain patterns refer? Because they're not this. And this is, this is the thing that makes our job really, really challenging. We have these for nerves, but what if it's a, if it's a disc? It looks a little bit different. Those, those facet joints and those cervical discs might be coming out at the same level as the nerve, but they're going to have a different pain pattern. And we're actually going to see that if we, if we look at what degenerative disc disease looks like, we, we can see that, okay, we have some evidence of facet joint arthritis. We have some cervical disc disease. Where is the pain? There might be a number of different, uh, different levels. And this is where our things like injections and procedures can help figure out what the target level is. But when we look at the actual pain pattern, it looks more like this. Whereas before we had stuff that was going down the arm, now our cervical disc disease as well as cervical facet joints are going to refer in a different pain pattern into the base of the neck, into the scapula, between the shoulder blades. All these are really important in terms of figuring out what's the primary pain generator. When we talk about targeted therapies for the neck, many of these are the same that we have in the lumbar spine. We have things like epidural steroid injections, such as this picture on the right, where we're going into the epidural space and trying to put some numbing medicine and steroid to, to allow that nerve to calm down so it's not acting up so much, and also to decrease swelling in the cervical spinal cord. That's one. That's if we think that there's a, uh, a cervical radiculopathy or a nerve root entrapment. We also have things like facet joint procedures, medial branch box or injections into the joint themselves. And for this, we're treating those bones on the back of the spine, worse with neck movement rotating around. And for this, we can actually put some numbing medicine on that nerve. And if it helps, we can go back and burn that nerve. That's called the radiofrequency ablation, which we've talked about before in the low back. If, if patients fail this and have a significant amount of disc disease as well as spinal canal stenosis, they might actually benefit for, our, for a surgical referral to one of our surgeons where they can actually go in and do a definitive fixation where they pull out the, the disc itself, relieve the compression on the spinal cord, and do a fusion from the front and a minimally invasive approach without big rods and screws in the back of the neck. This is one of those things that's a home run for procedure for the correct patient. And that's why working closely with our colleagues is so important. And then after that, if, if we have patients that fail, we can consider doing things like intrathecal drug delivery or, or spinal cord stimulation. These are other options for treatment of pain. And this really brings us to our kind of next level. Neck pain is a challenging thing to deal with both from start to finish in terms of where the pain starts, where the pain goes, and it can be extremely disruptive to your life. It can lead to headache syndromes. It can lead to uh, inability to perform basic, basic functions. And so diagnosing and getting this, getting this figured out early is really, really important. On top of these things, if we have things like muscle pain, we can consider uh, doing things like Botox or nerve blocks or occipital injections. All of these things can be helpful for the patient. Physical therapy can be something that's very, very beneficial as well. But as part of that pain cycle that we were talking about before, the goal is to utilize therapies to break that pain cycle so that we can strengthen the spine, strengthen the muscles, and prevent future injury. Our next four weeks are going to be, I think, pretty fun. We're going to do a special focus over these next four weeks where we talk about spinal cord stimulation. And we're not gonna do it as a, okay, it's a pain blocker. It's going to block the, block the signals to, this, to the brain. No, the goal of the next four weeks is to really dive deep into something that I find to be an extremely promising therapy for the right patient. And this can be extremely useful for you if you're considering it or a loved one has one, or even you're struggling with one that's not working. I, I wanna talk about why we use spinal cord stimulators, who we use spinal cord stimulators for, how they work, the best troubleshoot some of the issues with them. And that's not, 
that's not to say it's not the right therapy, but I get referrals from patient for, I, I get referrals from providers for spinal cord stimulators. And I want to make sure that, that the physician is involved and in actively participating in the care of the spinal cord stimulator because it's a wonderful therapy done correctly. Mm -hmm.